Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries, and in this RPG review, I'm going to be looking at Numenera, the game of Weird Fantasy by Monty Cook. And the game defines itself as science fantasy, taking place in the Ninth World, a setting built on the bones and long-forgotten technology of previously advanced civilizations that are now almost incomprehensible to the people who scratch out a living amongst the detritus of the past. Essentially, this is a very clever way of creating a pseudo-medieval fantasy world that incorporates elements of technology that are almost indistinguishable as magic, since to the majority of the people in the Ninth World Technology, or Numenera as it's called, is so advanced and incomprehensible to them that it may as well be magic. I'm reviewing the hard copy colour version of the book. You can see the beautiful cover there. And it's just over about 400 pages in length. The central mechanic of Numenera revolves around rolling a d20 and equaling or exceeding a target number assigned by the GM. Tasks have a difficulty rating of 1 to 10. A difficulty rating of 0 means that it's a task so easy or mundane that you don't have to make a roll. The target number of the roll, i.e. what you need to roll equal to or above, is equal to 3 times the difficulty number. So a task with difficulty 1 would have a target number of 3, a task with a difficulty of 2 would have a target number of 6, and so on and so forth. There are two levels of skill within the game. Players can be either trained or specialised. These don't add to the resolution role as with some other systems, but instead lower the difficulty by one point if trained or two points if specialised. This in turn lowers the target number by the appropriate amount, three and six respectively, making it far easier to pass the roll. Players can also spend points from their stat pools, which is speed, might and intellect, to put additional effort into roles, again lowering the difficulty level of the roles. Higher tier characters can spend more effort at once and typically have higher stat pools from which to spend. I like this because although characters do become more powerful as they advance in level or tiers as they're called in the game, the main strength isn't just the raw power, it means they can keep going for longer before their pools are depleted. Meaning they still have an advantage, but there isn't the monumental power gap between low and high level characters that you see in some other games. The rule system does take a little bit of getting used to. Lowering the difficulty isn't quite as intuitive as, say, adding a bonus to a roll, and some may not be overly fond of the idea of spending stat points to gain additional benefits, seeing it as a sort of gamey mechanic. But in practice, I've found that the rules are fairly easy to get to grips with, and then after a session or two, it almost becomes second nature. So, let's break down the contents. First of all, we have the introduction, Dreaming of the Future, and it sets out the aims of the system, creating a game where players decide how much effort they want to put into actions, and creating a world that mixes fantasy and science fiction in a way that feels very much like fantasy, and is actually, if you look at it, science fiction. The author talks about various games, arts and books that have influenced the creation of the RPG. This was quite interesting, and it only lasts for a couple of pages, so it doesn't have a chance to drag on or start to become boring. It also gives the budding Numenera GM or players some great places they can go to get inspiration for their own games. We then move on to the opening fiction, the Amber Monolith, and this is a piece of fiction titled after the Amber Monolith, which is featured on the cover of the book. You can see it there in the middle of it's presented as a sort of gospel from the Amber Papacy, an organisation that combines both aspects of a religion and a scientific study group, and who seek to understand the Numenera and the technology of the setting. It's written by the grandniece of High Father Calaval, Amber Pope, founder of the Citadel of the Conduit and the Order of the Truth. It details Calavel's attempt to enter and understand the Amber Monolith, and it does a very good job of setting the scene for one of the most iconic organisations in the game. As fiction goes, 
I personally didn't find it wildly exciting, although it was well written, and I like the fact it was told as a gospel being written sometime afterwards rather than just as a simple telling of the story. So it leaves a bit of room for bias and potential misinterpretation in there, and quite a lot of leeway if a GM actually wanted to use it. So I'm all in favour of that. Part one of the book is titled Getting Started, and it's fairly short, being no more than half a dozen pages in length. It gives an introduction to the ninth world and how it is built on the foundations of the previous eight. Even in such a small space, the writing is very evocative, talking about how even the dust of the ninth world, or drit as it's called in the setting, is actually microfilings and powdered artificial remnants of structures, people and items from long forgotten civilizations. In broad strokes, a picture of the ninth world is creating. People delving into the mysteries of the past and finding strange items of power and incomprehensible purpose, but trying to use them and mash them into their everyday lives. The first chapter of part one paints an anachronistic view of the ninth world where older, more traditional methods and materials rub shoulders with synthetic alloys, hovering carts and other far stranger things, all of them being thrown together by people struggling desperately to understand them and take some measure of control over their own life. Chapter 2 in the first section is How to Play Numenera, and it goes into more depth about how the dice rolling mechanic in the game works and how difficulty ratings are assigned. I like that as well as a description, i.e. routine, simple, standard, etc., of a task, that in the task difficulty column there's also additional guidance offered. For example, we're told that a standard task requires focus, but that most people can usually do it. I think this will be very useful for quick reference by a GM during play. Chapter 2 also talks about how being skilled in a particular area, having certain equipment or perhaps even favourable circumstances can modify a role by decreasing the difficulty by a number of steps, each step lowering the role's target number by 3. And conversely, unfavourable circumstances can raise the difficulty by a number of steps. It's quite an easy to grasp system and after a while it becomes almost second nature. Although, as I said earlier, I don't think it's quite as intuitive as simply adding modifiers to a dice roll. But that's a nitpicky little detail. It's certainly not much more difficult. There are two levels of skill in Numenera. You can be either trained or specialised. With trained lowering the difficulty rolls by one step and specialised lowering it by two. Combat is touched on in this chapter, and it's here that the Numenera method of having difficulty levels for roles starts to shine. Each opponent the PC faces has a level, and this determines what number a PC needs to roll to hit them, i.e. a level 2 creature would require a 6 or more on your roll to hit. On a successful hit, weapons do a flat level of damage, with armour deducting from that damage. This is a very simple system, and works well in play. Numenera is a player-facing system, which means that the GM doesn't roll any dice. If the PCs are attacking someone, then they roll to attack. If they are being attacked by someone, then they roll for defence, using the creature's difficulty level to determine the target number of their defence roll. There are a few other little bits for combat, such as rolling a 19 and 20, giving additional extra effects, but by and large, all you need for combat is covered in this chapter, in a very straightforward and easy-to-understand manner. Also briefly mentioned are GM intrusions, and these are methods by which the GM can introduce additional plot complications. Effectively, the GM proposes a complication and offers the affected player 2 XP, one of which they keep for themselves, and one of which they must immediately give to another one of their fellow players. If the player accepts, then the XP is marked down and the complication occurs. I love this as a system. It rewards players for accepting additional complications that can enrich the plot, although I can see it might get a little bit irritating if it was overused by an overly enthusiastic GM. Part 2 of the book is titled Characters, and it begins with Chapter 3, Creating Your Characters. And that starts with a discussion of the three main game stats, Might, Speed and Intellect. These pulls function as both a measure of health, with a character becoming increasingly impaired as their pulls fall, and as a pool of points that a character can spend to reduce the difficulty of rolls they might make by applying effort. This idea of higher stats, meaning that you have more pull to spend on rolls, rather than adding to individual rolls, took me a little time to get my head around, but it seems to work fairly well in practice. Players may spend these pulls, 
as I say, applying effort as the game calls it, as limited by their character tier or level on roles that are important to them. Although the effort must be spent before the dice roll is made. I like this since it gives the players more choice regarding their fate, and I'm a big fan of anything that puts more choices in the hands of the players. Character progression is also discussed here. Effectively, the PCs have to buy four benefits with XP before they move up a tier or level and gain access to new abilities based on their character type. One of the things I really love about Numenera is that your character is built based around a small phrase, such as, I am a swift nano who rides the lightning, or I am an intelligent glaive who lives in the wilderness. The noun, nano and glaive in our examples, is the character type, the adjective, swift and intelligent, is your descriptor, and the verbs, ride the lightning and lives in the wilderness, are your focus. You choose these from some long and varied lists at character gen, each of them granting abilities that become active, normally costing pool points to use, at certain tiers. I like this method since I think it allows you to sum up your character in a sentence, and, in my opinion, encourages you to think about your character as more than a collection of stats and a level number right from the get-go. The skills list in Newman Era is fairly small, totaling 30 skills, and is presented more as a list of suggestions rather than a definitive hard skill list. With the simple way that training and specialisation works in the game, I think this is a good idea. It gives enough suggestions to be going on with as a sort of default level for the setting, but it doesn't try too hard to lock players into thinking that those are the only skills available. This would also make it fairly easy by tweaking the skill list to adapt this part of the system to other settings. Chapter 4 is called Character Type, and it breaks down the three main character types, which are as follows. Glaives, who are warriors and fighters, nanos, who are tech specialists and shaman, and jacks, who are explorers and everyman adventurers. Starting stats are determined by character type, and... As well as listing the powers and abilities available to each type, the chapter also provides further customization options by providing background options to pick from. For example, a glaive's prowess can come from either intensive training, inborn traits, or biomechanical modifications. Each of these options provides additional background and plot suggestions that can be used to add detail to your character, along with a random table that gives you a notable event in your character's background. For example, rolling a d20 now and getting a 14 tells me that my glaive has a friend who he smokes rare and expensive tobacco with. We get together weekly for a chat and a smoke. This has no real game effect but can spur creative thought about the character. For example, in my Numenera game, one of the characters, Ryder Allsop, rolled that he had a relative who ran a theatre in town, and we got an awful lot of plot out of that. The powers and abilities that characters gain at each tier are listed and are very interesting, although personally I think this game doesn't shine so much for the rules, although they're easy to learn and fun to run with, but more for the way in which it tries to encourage creative thought and interesting character concepts. Chapter 5 goes into more details regarding the character descriptors. A few examples given are charming, graceful, mystical slash mechanical, strong and tough. Each descriptor has a nice little write-up, gives a small modifier to your stat pool, maybe a bit of extra tech and equipment, and a small selection of options to detail why your character has become involved in the starting adventure. These are all written in a very interesting way and combined with the various character types and focuses give you a vast array of different potential combinations. My personal favourite is the mystical slash mechanical descriptor, effectively giving someone cantrip-like abilities that they may attribute to either science or magic. And I like it because, as well as being a big time lover of the cantrips, it also highlights that technology and magic are virtually indistinguishable to the average everyday person of the ninth world. And, let's face it, as I said, who doesn't love cantrips? Little bits of magic that can be used to add flavour to a game without vastly overpowering it. I'm a big time lover of them, as I say. 
We move on to chapter 6, which is all about character focus. And in a similar style to the last chapter, this one goes into more detail regarding the character foci. A few examples are Bears a Halo of Fire, Explores Dark Places, Howls at the Moon, Murders or Works Miracles. And each of these descriptors gives access to additional abilities at various tiers, as well as some extra equipment. Each of them also suggests connections you may have with some of the other PCs. For example, someone with the Talks to Machines focus must pick another PC who has a terrible relationship with machines, making it a little more difficult to sweet-talk recalcitrant tech when they are about. Chapter 7 is titled Equipment, and unlike some games where the equipment chapter can be a little bit dull and dry, Numenera does a good job of not only keeping it brief, the main table of equipment's only two pages, but also giving an interesting insight into the strangeness of the Ninth World by summarising a number of rare and odd materials that things may be made out of. All of this material is great for adding that odd flavour that is at the heart of what makes Numenera different from a lot of other fantasy games. My only small gripe, and it is a very, very small one, is that there's not much in the way of art in this chapter, and it would have been nice to see a few examples of the strange weaponry used by the Ninth Worlders. Part 3 is titled Playing the Game, and Chapter 8 deals with the rules of the game, going into more detail about how it actually works, although it's scarcely necessary given that the rules are quite simple. What this chapter does really well, though, is that since the rules are so easy to understand, it provides a lot of examples and suggestions for dealing with situations that aren't explicitly covered by the rules. There's also some additional important details, such as how losing stat pools affects characters and how healing works. Effectively, characters in Numenera can make recovery rolls after increasing intervals to regain 1d6 plus their level pool points to distribute as they see fit amongst their attributes. A lot of this chapter is taken up with more detailed descriptions of the various actions that can be attempted by player characters, and elements such as crafting equipment, Numenera, etc. However, this is more of a reference chapter. It's cleanly laid out and not complicated, which is what I like to see in this sort of chapter. If you're going to make a reference chapter, you want people to be able to dip in, get what they want as quickly as possible, and then jump back out again, without having to flick through endless pages, searching in vain for what they want. And Numenera does a very good job of this. It's the chapter's there when you want it, but it's unobtrusive and out of the way when you don't. Chapter 9 is perhaps pandering to people who like a bit more crunch in their game and deals with optional rules, providing a whole host of additional bolt-on rules that are not used by the core streamlined rule system, but can be added on if additional individual gaming groups wish them to be. Quite a few of these are to do with adding extra detail to combat, or making it more tactical. It's not something I'm particularly interested in, but it's nice to see it there as an option for those who want it. And as I said, I'm all for giving players more options. My personal favourite part of this section are the random mutation tables, which put me very much in mind of the similar tables in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I also think that the cosmetic mutation table could be great for creating different abhuman strains with variable appearances. For example, a group of humans who all have purple lips and head crests might be an interesting encounter and would very much fit in with Numenera's theme of the weird and the strange. Part 4 covers the setting, beginning with chapter 10, Living in the Ninth World. The setting of Numenera, the so-called Ninth World, is intriguing and very detailed. I'm not going to explore it all here since that would make this review even longer than it already is. Suffice to say that the world is a Pangaea-like setting boasting one huge supercontinent built on the ruins of previous great ages, where massively powerful galaxy-spanning civilizations who could perform great feats of solar engineering and create a world teeming with microscopic nanites existed. Not to undersell the setting, but the Ninth World is basically justification to have a fantasy-style setting where barely understood technology takes the place of magic, and where anachronisms are not only encouraged, but are also hard-baked into the setting right from the get-go. For example, a trader may ride on a rickety cart clad in a hessian garment, but he's just as likely to sit astride a strange floating disc 
or wear garments fabricated from synthetic materials stripped from the relics of a previous age and repurposed into clothing. The first few pages discuss the world, everyday life, religion, literacy and animals in a small amount of detail, giving tantalising glimpses into the strange mishmash of past and future that makes up the Ninth World. We also learn that the current age began about 900 years ago, when the forerunner of the Aeon priests, a pseudo-religious technical order, began to unite the barbarian tribes of humans and begin that long struggle back towards civilization. Of particular interest in this chapter to me is the mention of a weather phenomena called the Iron Wind, a roaming storm cloud of nanites that disassembles and rebuilds anyone unlucky enough to be caught in the path of the storm, often to crazy or disastrous designs, blending artificial and biological elements together. And I think that's very interesting as a plot device, and as justification for all manner of crazy scenery, mutated NPCs and monstrous creatures. Chapter 11 deals with the Steadfast, which is a ready-made gazetteer zooming in on a part of the Ninth World, comprising nine rival kingdoms. It's more civilised, although no less dangerous, than a lot of the rest of the Ninth World, and it offers a lot of potential for variety and adventure. The kingdoms are given brief descriptions with select locations and people having more detail provided. My personal favourite is the Sea Kingdom of Garn, which is a kingdom built on trade and the power of its merchant navy fleet. It has a slightly more freewheeling feel than some of the other kingdoms, and I can picture it being great for scenes of piratical adventure and nautical daring do. I also like the capital city of Garn, which is described as a series of platforms emerging from the sea and connected by linked walkways built of scavenged prior world materials. One of the things I like through this chapter are the small box outs that provide strange rumours and hearsay that the characters might run into on their travels through the kingdoms. These are all very interesting and any one of them could be the basis for an adventure or future plot. Chapter 12 and 13 cover the beyond and beyond the beyond and they're both laid out in a similar manner to chapter 11. They cover areas that are outside the nine kingdoms and that are located on the very fringes of the known world for chapter 12 or sometimes beyond it for chapter 13. These are a bit of a mixed bag with some of the areas and ideas being more interesting than others. I think though that given the wide variety in these two chapters that you're bound to find at least something that suits your particular taste. And to be honest, even those that I wasn't particularly fond of weren't boring, they were still interesting to read which can only be a good thing. Part 5 of the book deals with creatures and characters and we'll crack straight on with chapter 15, Creatures. And I'm always a bit wary when it comes to bestiary chapters in a book, since so much of the stuff featured in RPG bestiaries has been absolutely done to death before. However, I'm pleased to report that the creatures and beasts listed in this chapter of the Numenera core book are some of the weirdest, coolest, and most interesting creatures that I've seen in an RPG to date. From the ape-like Calorail, a creature fusing biological and technological material together, to the Orgulian soldier, mechanical warriors created for a war long forgotten, and programmed by means of sound waves. None of the creatures in this book are bland or forgettable. Each comes with full stats, ecology information, and suggestions for using GM intrusions and plot ideas concerning them. The creatures really hammer home that feeling of the ninth world, something that is at once slightly familiar and yet entirely strange. The chapter also offers simple rules and advice for creating your own creatures, and this can be as simple as assigning them a level and how much damage they can deal, how much armour they have, or can be more detailed. It's great to see the author not only providing a great selection of his own creatures, but also giving budding GMs the tools they need to make their own. Chapter 16 is non-player characters, and it finishes off the fifth part of the book by giving a sample list of Ninth World NPCs, ranging from Aeon Priests to Bandits, Explorers and Town Guards, and a number of other standard NPCs. There's only a smattering of them in this chapter, but each is quite interesting and could be used in a number of different situations, with only a minimal amount of reskinning required. 
There's also a small selection of ready-to-use minor NPCs, complete with names and personalities. These are great to pick up and just run with, and also neatly illustrate how easy it can be to design NPCs using Numenera's rules. Part 6 is titled The Numenera, and Chapter 17, Technology, discusses the items of technology scavenged from previous civilizations that form a staple part of the Ninth World economy. The Numenera, as per the title of the game. These strange items of technology, as we've said earlier, are so incomprehensible in the main that they're almost indistinguishable from arcane forces or magic, and they occupy a similar place to enchanted items and other such things in a more traditional fantasy RPG like, say, D&D. The book offers some great advice on how the appearance of Numenera can be affected by where it was found, whether it was scavenged from ruins, cobbled together from unrelated bits of lesser oddities, or some other manner. This chapter is very short, but gives a sufficient overview to the place of the Numenera in the Ninth World, and I expect it's going to be followed up on by future supplements. Chapter 18 talks about ciphers, which are one-use items cobbled together from bits of junk and stolen tech. They're frequently discovered by player characters in Numenera, and are supposed to be fairly commonplace. The idea, as presented by the book, isn't to hoard them for a rainy day, but to get them and to spend them fairly freely, since there will always be more ciphers to discover. However, a character can only carry so many of them, since the unpredictable energies that power them interact with each other and can produce disastrous effects. This put me in mind of the limit on magic rings and such like in D&D. The effect of the danger is determined by rolling a D100 on a random table and adding 10 to the result for each cipher over the character's maximum, making it far more potentially dangerous and explosive to carry a lot of them. There then follows a list of 100 ciphers ranging from adhesion clamps to X-ray viewers. These are all fairly interesting, and I like the fact that the same cipher could be found as a pill in one point of your adventure, and then later on a similar item might be a bracelet, allowing the GM um, to keep the characters guessing and hammering home that feeling about the alien nature of the item's creators. Chapter 19 deals with artifacts, which are more permanent Numenera that can be reused, although they do have a random chance of depleting their energy reserves each time they are used. A hundred artifacts of various types are listed, although my favourite bit is the table of quirks that can be used to give a bit more personality to an artifact. Perhaps it produces an oily residue when used, or maybe it drains heat from the area around it. These are all quite interesting and quite amusing. Again, these items can all easily be reskinned with minimal effort. For example, I used a device known as an ecstasy paralyzer in my game, and these are effectively a device that, as per the book, fires a beam of energy that, if it strikes someone, renders them incapable of acting due to pure pleasure. But I changed it from a handheld beam-firing device to a non-beam-firing charged stun baton in my game, and that was just a matter of changing the description. No mechanical alterations were required, and that worked absolutely fine. Chapter 20 deals with oddities and discoveries. By far my favourite types of Numenera, oddities are just that. Quirky items of Numenera that have little to no practical use, but have interesting properties, such as a fragile crystal that smashes easily, but always reforms into its original shape, or a candle that never runs down when lit. These are like the Numenera equivalent of cantrip items, and an ingenious player will find all sorts of ways to use them. There is some very brief information for GMs on creating Numenera, but it's not particularly expansive or really very useful in my opinion, seeming to have almost been dropped in as an afterthought. I suspect this too is something that's going to be expanded on in other supplements. Part 7 of the game is Running the Game, and Chapter 21 is titled Using the Rules, and it wastes no time in pushing forward the fact that Numenera is a game based on story rather than simulation, explaining that anything opposing the PCs can be viewed as a plot obstacle to be overcome or worked around, I think the system of giving antagonists, traps, etc. levels of difficulty works really well with this philosophy, neatly allowing the creation of such game aspects with minimal crunch, but allowing as much or little customization as the GM wants. The chapter reprints the task difficulty chart from earlier, 
and discusses a little more how GMs can go about assigning appropriate difficulty ratings to tasks. This will be very useful stuff when you're first getting used to the system. There's also a discussion on when it's appropriate to use GM intrusions and awarding XP outside of GM intrusions. If you're anything like me, this will be one of the most referenced chapters at the end of your sessions. There's some great GM advice on handling the Numenera, ciphers, artifacts, etc. When to have the PCs make dice rolls and NPCs. And this is all very useful and laid out in a clean, easy to understand format. I've been a fan of Monty Cook's products since I first picked up a copy of Arcana on Earth back in my third edition days, and I've always valued the thought put into the GM advice in books such as Iron Heroes. I'm glad to see that Numenera continues this tradition of providing quality, useful, and accessible pointers for an aspiring GM. Now, if chapter 21 was the GM advice equivalent of an appetizer, then get ready for chapter 22, Building a Story, which is the main course. And it takes you through, step by step, how to run sessions, and even campaigns, highlighting important aspects like crafting stories, pacing, and the sorts of things you do in your first session to ease the players into the game. I was pleased with the last chapter, but this one blew me away. A lot of it seems very obvious when you're reading it, but just having it there in black and white in the core book is incredibly helpful, especially for those times when you find yourself maybe a bit stuck and you're sat there trying to think up a session or how you're going to run a game. Just flicking through this chapter should get your grey matter working on it and give you some pointers. Chapter 23, Realising the Ninth World, is the cherry on top of the GM advice cake. And it's all about those weird elements that set a Numenera campaign apart from a more traditional fantasy campaign and how you can use them in your games for maximum impact. Each paragraph has a descriptive title or tagline such as describe, don't define or don't use one idea, use two or more. And then it breaks it down in a couple of easy to understand paragraphs of discussion, making it great for quick reference as well as more thorough reading. The chapter then goes on to discuss ways of varying the default setting post-apocalyptic and weird horror, just to give you two examples, and also ways in which you can use technology in your games, but still make it seem alien and bizarre, rather than just having your players go, oh, it's obviously a machine gun. This chapter is very interesting to read and offers some great advice. Part 8 features four different adventures, running from chapter 24 to chapter 27, titled... Adventures Overview, The Beal of Borgal, Seed Ship and The Hidden Price. I don't want to go into these too much since I don't want to spoil it for people running the adventures. But they're all well written and cover the gamut from exploring a long forgotten terraforming craft to a jaunt around much of the Ninth Kingdoms. Each comes with a breakdown of the plot, potential encounters and some very nicely drawn maps. Even if you don't plan to run these adventures, they'll be very useful for giving you some ideas of possible ways that you can write up your own games. The book rounds off with Part 9, Appendices. Uh, Appendix A is a very useful step-by-step -step guide to creating a character. Great for quick reference or for printing out and handing to players who maybe don't have the core book. Appendix B is a bibliography and it's always interesting to me personally to see where authors get their ideas, so I love the inclusion of this. And Appendix C is the almost obligatory list of Kickstarter backers. So, in conclusion, if in case it's not obvious from this review, I'm a big fan of Numenera. Initially, I was a little put off by the rules, to be honest, because I didn't find them particularly intuitive. Having played and run games, though, I think this was most likely a misconception on my part. The rules are very easy to get into and run with. And most important of all, in my opinion, they don't get in the way too much when you're trying to create or tell an exciting story. The book itself is beautiful and is available for 19 99 and that's US dollars for the PDF version and 59 99 US dollars for a hardcover print version. It's not the cheapest book you're going to find about if you order the physical copy. However, for a full cover, beautifully illustrated book that contains all you need to start creating your own weird fantasy adventures in the ninth world, you really can't go far wrong. The PDF version is also 
nicely bookmarked for ease of navigation. If you're looking for a great and unusual setting that has an awful lot of potential, either play straight out of the box as it were, or for further customization with a rule set that allows an awful lot of player options whilst removing a lot of unnecessary weight from the shoulders of the poor beleaguered GM, then you'll more than likely enjoy this game. I've thoroughly enjoyed running it, I've thoroughly enjoyed playing it, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and that if you have, you'll consider clicking on like, and subscribe to my channel by clicking on the red dice up there. If you have any comments or thoughts on it, please put them in the comments box below, or hit me up in the Google Plus links. Until I see you next time, thank you very much for watching and listening. Take care.